Live NFL trivia every Tuesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge and have a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. By now, you've probably heard the news that Atlanta Falcons wide receiver Julio Jones got traded to the Tennessee Titans. The trade was something that had been talked about for a while, and the probable future Hall of Fame receiver, after a decade in Atlanta, is moving on. But imagine this. If you're watching this video on its published date, then today, the Falcons are holding minicamp. Imagine if Julio went to Falcons minicamp, despite now being on the Titans. Obviously, something like this would be ridiculous. Why the heck would you work out and practice with a team that you don't even play for anymore? Julio will practice with the Titans because, well, he's a member of the Titans. It's pretty simple. However, as crazy and as ridiculous as this sounds, that actually happened once. In 1967, after being traded to the Atlanta Falcons, wide receiver Tommy McDonald decided to practice with the Los Angeles Rams. And this is the story behind what might be the strangest practice in NFL history. Before I talk about the actual practice, we need some context as to the player in question. Because the player we're talking about here is one of the greatest receivers to ever play the sport. His name is Tommy McDonald, and was arguably the most dominant wide receiver of his era. McDonald was drafted by the Philadelphia Eagles in the third round of the 1957 NFL Draft, with the team badly needing some help at the wide receiver position after posting six receiving touchdowns in 1956, which was easily the worst total in all of football. Bobby Walston was the only receiver who had more than two receiving touchdowns that year, and he led the team by finding the end zone three times. It was that bad. So with that, they drafted McDonald. And while McDonald didn't do much of anything as a rookie, only catching nine passes, by 1958, he was a force to be reckoned with. The Eagles had been looking for a game-changing receiver after Pete Fio's departure a few years before, and McDonald was that guy they were looking for. During that 1958 season, he led the NFL with nine receiving touchdowns, and he averaged over 20 yards per catch, which was fifth in the league. What's incredible about this season, which was good enough for McDonald to make the Pro Bowl, was that he wasn't even the starter. He only started three games that year. It wasn't until 1959 when he was thrust into the starting position. But throughout the late 1950s and the early 1960s, there was perhaps not a better receiver in football than McDonald. He made the Pro Bowl five straight years from 1958 to 62. He led the league in receiving touchdowns and yards in 1961. He was named a second-team All-Pro by the Associated Press twice in that stretch. And he finished inside the top five of the league in receptions three times in those five years. From 1958 to 61, McDonald finished either first or second in the league in touchdown catches every single year, and in 1960 and 1961, set a then-franchise record for receiving touchdowns with 13. Even though the game has heavily evolved to a more passer-friendly league since McDonald's time, that franchise record would still stand all the way until 2004, and of course, he was an instrumental part to Philly's success in 1960, when the Eagles won their third NFL championship in franchise history. But when the mid-1960s rolled around, he was looking to keep building that legacy in Los Angeles. After playing the 1964 season with the Dallas Cowboys, McDonald got traded to the Rams in the 1965 offseason in exchange for kicker and punter Danny Villanueva. For a veteran like McDonald to be on his third team in three years could have been a problem and a massive hindrance on his play. Instead, McDonald put up some incredible numbers with LA. He had a career-high 67 receptions. He had 1,036 yards, posting over 1,000 yards for the third time in his career. He scored nine touchdowns, which was the most he had in the season since 1962. He averaged 74 yards per game, which was the third highest total of his career. And he made it to the Pro Bowl for the sixth and final time in his career. The 1965 season, where McDonald finished second in receptions and third in receiving yards, added to his already incredible legacy. Unfortunately for him, things would begin to decline after that. Blame it on a quarterback change if you wish, as the team went from Bill Munson to Roman Gabriel. Blame it on injuries, as he did miss some time that year with a knee problem. Blame it on father time. But in 1966, McDonald's play drastically declined. He had 714 receiving yards, which was the second lowest total of his career since 1958. He averaged a mere 13 yards per catch, which was the worst total of his career. He scored two touchdowns, which was the worst total of his career. McDonald was still putting up fairly decent numbers, and he still belongs in the league, but it was clear that it was looking like the beginning of the end. By the time the 1967 preseason rolled around, McDonald was in and out of the starting lineup. He was not the same player that he once was. And the Rams had some quality receivers waiting in the wings ready to get some quality playing time. Jack Snow was a top 10 draft pick in 1965. Bernie Casey, who had three straight seasons with 50 plus receptions, was acquired that offseason from the San Francisco 49ers. And unlike McDonald, he was on the right side of 30. 
Bucky Pope was a few years removed from leading the NFL in touchdown catches when he had 10 during the 1964 season. McDonald's time was running out, and when the Rams cut their roster down to 40 players, McDonald was not going to be involved in the team's plans whatsoever. But what followed might just be the most awkward practice in the history of the NFL. As an expansion team in 1966, the Atlanta Falcons were obviously not very good, as is the case with just about every single expansion team in football. And while they had many holes during that first year, one of the biggest ones was at wide receiver. They were a young team. No receiver was over the age of 30, so they needed a veteran presence. And they needed someone who could play, as in 1966, not a single receiver on the Falcons had more than three touchdowns. The only qualified player to average over 25 yards a game at the position was Alex Hawkins. They needed a receiver badly, and the Rams seemingly had a surplus of receivers. So with that, a trade was executed. The Falcons would give up a draft pick, and in return, they would receive one of the greatest receivers in the history of the sport, Tommy McDonald. No, he was not the same player he once was, and he was clearly on the decline, but he was immediately going to be one of the top players on Atlanta's offense, and he was going to be a veteran presence for an awfully young team. It seemed like a smart trade on paper, and under normal circumstances, this is where our story would end. But obviously, this is not a normal story. You see, after the trade was confirmed, McDonald went to go practice with the Rams. Prior to practicing, he was informed about the trade to Atlanta. He said that he was surprised about the trade, but that he's been traded a few times before, so he was used to it. No hard feelings whatsoever. And obviously, there was enough time in between the informing of the news and the Rams' practice for McDonald to call Falcons coach Hacker. But when McDonald was informed of the trade, instead of leaving and taking the first flight to Atlanta, he asked the coaching staff if he could stay and practice with the team. McDonald said on this request, Heck, I was all dressed. I felt it might help me to get ready for Atlanta. And amazingly enough, even though McDonald was not a Ram anymore and he was a Falcon, the coaching staff said yes. The odds that the Falcons knew that one of their players was practicing for a completely different team were slim to none, considering the way and the speed in which news traveled back then. That's not the surprising part. The surprising part was that the coaching staff and front office on the Rams allowed him to do this. One freak injury, and the trade is getting called off, and the Falcons might even be able to take the Rams to court and wonder why a player they acquired is working with another team. Commissioner Pete Rozell could have come in and issued a penalty against the Rams. The whole situation could have been a giant mess that I can't believe the Rams actually put themselves in. But despite not being a member of the Rams anymore, he practiced with the team. And a few days later, after nothing happened, he was off to Atlanta to join the Falcons and help them out. That raises the final question. How did McDonald's career finish? Would this trade wind up benefiting the Falcons? Well, not really. The good news for Atlanta was that McDonald was the best receiver on the team. He led the team in receptions, receiving yards, and touchdowns. The bad news was that, unfortunately, that wasn't saying a whole lot. He had 33 receptions, which was the lowest total of his career since 1958 and the worst total of his career since becoming a starter. He had 436 receiving yards, which, excluding 1957 when he barely played, was the worst total of his career. And he had four receiving touchdowns, with none of them coming in the first six games of the season. It took a very long time for McDonald to get acclimated to Atlanta from a high-production standpoint. McDonald did not help the Falcons a whole lot, as the team went 1-12-1, comfortably finishing with the worst record and the worst offense in football. And after spending the 1968 season with the Cleveland Browns, he never played again. The crazy ending to his career and the natural decline of his production as he hit his mid-30s did not impact his legacy in the slightest bit, as he was eventually inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame, forever enshrined in canon. And by the time he retired, he ranked only behind Don Hudson in career receiving touchdowns. When he finishes the second leading receiver in NFL history, that's not too shabby. This whole incident with the Rams is a mere footnote in his illustrious career, but it's always fascinating when things like this happen, since you know there is not a chance in the world anything like this could happen today. A player practicing for a team that they didn't even play for anymore is absolutely absurd. But back in 1967, apparently, that was par for the course. And it resulted in what might be the strangest practice in the over 100-year history of the National Football League. Be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Monday and Tuesday night at 9pm Eastern for your chance to play NFL Trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at JRGator9 and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters who helped with the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can call my patron and request future video topics in the description below.